Rock and roll. There we go. Rock over. Take two works. Hello, Jill. Hello. <laughs> she will, she'll be right back. Hello, Jill, and hello, Gavin. Thanks for joining the inaugural live stream. Let's talk about climate action. I think before we dive into the subject that I think we all embrace in our daily lives, we should talk about who you are. So shall we start with, what shall we go by? By um, alphabet or shall we go by age before beauty? What's the <laughs> who wants to go first? I don't mind. I don't mind. <laughs> Jill, Jill's just sat down at her dinner, so we'll, we'll let Jill go. You, you, that's a good... That's a good uh, that way, good that way I, Jill can go on mute for two minutes of, and grab some of her dinner while, while I'm uh, uh, doing my introduction. Anyway, thanks, Axe. Thank you, Axel. Uh, very nice to be here tonight. Who am I? Um, Gavin Anderson, um, uh, predominantly known for doing branding and digital stuff, but you know, uh, the environment has always been a passion of mine, and I'm here tonight to kind of talk a little bit about uh, some of the projects um, I'm involved with, which includes in trying to clean up the carbon credit market, um, uh, trying to plant a farm, a seaweed farm the size of Spain. Um, wow. So, yeah, trying to kind of, uh, so whilst my, uh, I think, as you call it, um, it's my eco-activism, it, it is kind of just part of the way I live. I like repairing things. And I don't like throwing things out. I don't like waste. I, that's just the kind of, you know, uh, you know, son of a crofter. So I'm kind of used to, you know, nothing goes to waste. Um, but I think nowadays, the, 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 yeah, the game has changed a little bit because, you know, it, it it's, it's a bit more important than just you know washing out yogurt pots now, um, and we can't really kind of wait, um, unfortunately, for governments to do action. So I think by default, I think I've become a climate activist. I haven't glued myself to anything recently, but you know I am you know with with one of the projects I'm working. We've just um, purchased and retired twenty five thousand tons of carbon. You know the average person in the UK, you know, is equivalent. 10 12 tons a year so it, it's 10 to 12 tons of carbon a year is the average uh for the for uk and uh, you're gonna get me onto my nerdy subjects now it's like mastermind okay uk is the average adult um 10 to 12 tons of 10 carbon. to 12 tons yeah. um but in america for our american compadres um they're 25 tons these are all annual figures Wow. Oh, 25. I, I haven't right. even hit the high bar yet. I haven't even hit the high bar yet. What you say is usually at the top. In the UK, it's, it's um, very close to the top. Well, I, I have some other figures that will kind of peel it down the other way. So the, the, the really high one is 35 tonnes a year for the United Arab Emirates for living wow. in a desert. Um, and and then, then, then if we think of a Kenyan farmer, you know, Kenya, they'd be getting hit by... Uh, uh, you know, problems with climate change, they're impacting, they haven't caused it, you know, they haven't been driving the Range Rovers around, they're just suffering from it. The average yeah. Kenyan um, uh, carbon footprint is 0 0.002 of a ton. This is the thing which is so horrendously unfair about it all, is just like the people who are doing the least towards the problem and the people who end up with the, the worst outcomes of it all, you yeah. know. That's exactly it. And that's why I think it was interesting at COP26 this year that you know, there was a lot of talk about reparation and everybody mm -hmm. kind of furrowed a browser. Well, isn't it just about planting trees? Well, it's not. Because if we're going to help, you know, replace all those paraffin stoves in Africa because they're not connected to electricity, we're going to have to help them jump to wind power, jump to, you know, solar power. And the wonderful th opportunity with client, uh, with um, countries, uh, you know, all across Africa is, you know, if they can be giving a helping hand, they don't have to go through the fossil fuel bit. Mm. Yes, yeah, so we're good to skip that and go straight to the future rather than going back 100 years and yeah. starting with burning. That would be brilliant, wouldn't it? <laughs> It's, it's insane. Those, thank you, Gavin, for uh, the introduction, and nice to meet you. And we drifted um, way too much. Drifted. Yeah, this is this is uh, already uh, kind of uh, wow. Just uh, kicked my butt a little bit. Um, I've been looking at um, carbon emissions uh, in the UK, specifically Milton Keynes. But I, I actually, one that's, final that's a really yeah. good, um, really good context. One final mm -hmm. question for you, Act. I like this one. Mm -hmm. How many grams of carbon or CO2e, which is 
uh, uh, Carbon Dioxide. Yeah. Um, does an email use? Oh, oh, there's a website for this. Um, thank yeah, you. you're going to get the answer. You're not going to look up the website. Oh, I'm not going to look it up. I can't well, remember. You can't use Google. I'd, uh, I'm going to assume it is less than a Canyon Farmer. Uh, oh, it is. It's four grams. Four grams. But which means that email. you send an email, just your personal email, is equivalent of driving 220 miles in a petrol car. Okay. So email marketers have a lot to answer for then, really. They do. Just because it's digital doesn't mean it's green. Good point. Good point. Data mm -hmm. centers burn a lot, a lot, uh, mm -hmm. unless they happen to be under the sea or in Iceland. Uh, Jill's still eating, so maybe I can go second. No. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, I, I so. think that was a really nice segue, Axe, just as Jill put, put yeah. a bit yeah. of dinner back. No, segue to that. Jill. I'm just, yeah. just going to provide one more stat. Um the domestic emission, because I was looking at, uh, I'm looking to do a carbon farm. By the way, hi, I'm Axel. Um, I'm chief troublemaker at Be Braver, hi, and I'm trying to create a carbon farm, which is basically an agricultural business, uh, which aims to really uh, capture as much uh, carbon as Milton Keynes releases. And I looked this up the domestic emissions in 2020 for Milton Keynes were 360 kilotons. Three hundred sixty thousand tons. Yeah. So that's insane. And Milton Keynes is an average size uh, city, and it's looking to double. So I think in in the context of our local area, in, in going with the hashtag Climate Action MK, you know, wow, what do we have to do locally to bring that down? Because we were saying that it's between ten and twelve tons per person. Uh, multiply that by the people in Milton Keynes. That's, that's crazy. The so thing is, though, is that, um, you know, it, I, I read a book. I was actually offered a book by um, by Penguin Ram, Random House Audio mm -hmm. um, because I'm um, an eco-influencer. I'll go into introductions in a second. But um, cool. on um, the Bill Gates um, book, which has recently come out on how to solve a climate crisis, and the point that he seemed to be making throughout is that, you know, unfortunately, it's not now a case of us just all trying to reduce usage. Like, that's part of the picture. That's, mm. you know, a really good part of the picture. And by all means, where possible, we should do that. Um, but fundamentally, what I found really interesting about his viewpoint was that um, because he was coming at it obviously from the uh, philanthropic point of view um, that, you know, you can't say, right, you're not allowed electricity because electricity is bad, for example, because actually in a lot of cases, electricity and energy, et cetera, means gives people opportunities for progress, give people opportunities to progress their lives onto the next level. And there's no reason well, there obviously are reasons, but the, it shouldn't be the case that yeah. the poorest people in the world carry on getting the rawest deal. Yeah. Um, uh, what we need to do is actually solve how we make energy and make energy fundamentally greener from source. And, and that's going to be the solution. That's where we're at now. Yeah. I think also just to add to that, I think for for me, you know, the the, the my my big hobby horse, as Axel will know, is uh, carbon sequestration, which I know is easy for me to say, but taking carbon out of the <laughs> atmosphere. I mean, it, it, yeah. it's really for me, it's quite simple. If you think of you know, in a swingometer, if, if vertical is zero, where we're at net zero, you know, we're we're leaning in this direction, and we're we're planting trees to try and slow things down. So we're trying mm -hmm. to push the needle back up there. But with carbon sequestration, it's all about pulling the needle up and further back. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and these are the seaweed projects, the mango groves, hemp, mm -hmm. bamboo, because the and I feel really guilty about it, but but you know, part of my mission is to try and clean up the carbon credits, you know, market. And there's a lot of brilliant work out there. And we we work to to be clear, you know, I always work with either VCS, FERPA, or um, sorry, VCS, Vera, or gold standard carbon credits, yeah. because they, as far as I'm concerned, they have the 
highest quality uh, 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 checking of the carbon credits. Because mm. the, the, you know, if you know, the, I read a report uh, literally this morning, I think it was or yesterday morning, where the EU are going to try and label um, nuclear energy and another type of energy as as uh, sustainable, so people will get carbon credits for it. It's that that that's that's insanity. So mm -hmm. we have to actually we can't have people just making up their own rules. You know, gold standard and VCS. You know, that's they work with the UN. You know, it's the it's a, uh, uh, they actually chemically measure the soil before and afterwards to make sure carbon has been removed from it. Because what we've got, to, I think, for me within the whole, let's plant a tree. Let's you know. You know where recycle goes. We've got to have a benchmark of measurement. You know, so if the benchmark of measurement is going to be one ton of carbon, as verified by the UN and the gold standard, everything must be measured to that. You know, mm -hmm. and because the problem is, I think one of the challenges is people don't know how to save the planet. You know, mm. sometimes it's just reusing stuff. Sometimes you know. Uh, you know, I hate to shatter another illusion, but you know the word you know carbon footprint invented by BP to make us feel guilty. And, we and yet we've people. just been talking about it. Yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, you know, we don't have carbon footprints. The people that are pulling that oil out of the ground have the carbon footprint. Oh, don't let's save the oil excavation okay. thing and, the oil. until later. But let's let's go back to Jill and ask Jill. <laughs> well, first of all, Jill, welcome to the stream. I hope this is going to be a, a successful regular thing and to have you both on as much as possible. And then we invite yeah. loads of other interesting people, hopefully, who will join us and hopefully they will inspire us. And, and speaking of inspiration, Jill, it's your fault. As much as it's yeah. Gavin, but it's your fault, Jill, because I we used to work together at Cranfield University. Great place, by the way, for secondary, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, for, for postgraduate studies. And um, they're very much into their green thing and sustainability. But we did, in fact, meet um, as, a, as a polluter, as it turns out, I guess, because we worked in marketing. So we did a lot of email mm -hmm. marketing. But you inspired me because I learned back when we worked together at Cranfield that you um, were doing a blog under the guise of Jam Jar Jill, or they mm -hmm. called Jam Jar Jill. And that intrigued me. So I've been a long time lurker on your blog and now uh, the podcast yeah. and everything. And I'm so glad uh, that there is somebody uh, who is so very much right up my street and, and he's so active. So, Jill, please do tell us more about you, especially for those who are watching or are listening to us who might have not have come across your blog and your podcast. Right, yeah. So I've been blogging for about 11 years now. Um, mm. So been there sort of since the beginning of it becoming popularised, I guess. Um, the reason why I started the blog was after watching the film um, Julia and Julie, which is all about, um, it's like a split timeline film where um, Julia Childs, who's the woman who brought French cooking to America, is in the 1950s in France. And then um, Julia, who's a civil servant, then um, working in the call centre just after the Twin Towers. And um, both are looking for creativity and stuff in their lives. And, and basically, Julia Childs goes, it's one of the first women, if not the first woman, to go to the Cordon Bleu. And then, um, and then Julia decides to work her way through this French cooking book uh, 50 years later um, and write a blog about it and she gives herself a year to do it and um, yeah so that's kind of how I got onto the blogging journey in the first place but um, as it's developed it's kind of I think it's always had a natural eco slant because I guess I have a natural eco slant. Um, I was brought up to just respect nature and what I was putting in my body and I kind of see I guess if you want to call it a brand the brand is like I call myself now an eco-influencer um, because I very much try and make sure that everything which I'm promoting products which I'm testing ideologies which I'm trying to put out there all have that thread running through them um, that it's about trying to have a more natural life, but that's both in the holistic sense as well. 
um, and very much into sort of yoga and meditation and all that sort of side. And to me, the two the two sides of things just really join up. And, you know, I'm interested in just trying to be as green as possible in my day to day life and and um, just really push, I guess, my two sort of hashtags, which I like to push are um, conscious consumerism and making green mainstream. And I think, you know, it's a case that we've really, really progressed with this over the last couple of years and specifically um, over the pandemic, you know, the community has just built and built and built. And it's really something which I'm so proud to now be a part of, really, um, especially within Instagram, because and I, and I kind of like the um, juxtaposition, I guess, of um, being calling myself an eco influencer because the term influencer you know it has quite a few negative connotations um but I'm like well why don't we turn that on its head you know I remember when I first sort of mentioned eco influencer to my husband he was like oh you should be careful because you don't really want to be um you know typecast or whatever and um uh, but I kind of like that I'm deliberately going, well, actually, you no, know, this is using this platform for good. And I, I'd like to think that this is a way forward. Um, so it's about doing the grassroots stuff. It's about celebrating um, the wins wherever you can. You know, it's about, you know, the whole piece is so much around education, which is important. I have young children. I have five year old twins. So I just promote, you know, us going for walks in nature together and all that sort of side of things and us eating healthy meals and trying to source our food in a sustainable way where we can and just the whole piece, really, which to me, it's funny because a lot of it is just common sense to me because that's how I was brought up. So, but um, unfortunately, and you know, have a bit of a soapbox moment with this one because it really gripes me um, that at some point prior to me going to school, they concluded that home economics was sexist. So um, rather than teaching it to both sexes, they decided to scrap it from the education system, mm. um, which to me is just like utter madness because then you're you're reliant on you know just very busy stressed parents trying to teach their kids these things and if they don't then you know who is teaching them it and the and TikTok. then you get waves of children who think they get milk from supermarkets and yeah. and burgers from mcdonald's and don't have any understanding of where things come from and and I find it incredibly sad where our culture has kind of gone really wrong on this. And it's somehow to me, and yes, I'm typecasting and sweeping statement to a degree, but to me, it seems that like the French culture, the Italian culture, the German culture, the Spanish culture hasn't let it go in such a big way as we have done in the UK. I mean, to be honest, America is oftentimes worse again um, with all that stuff but um, you know I'm like it's all part of it it's like a big picture it's a big tapestry to me education thank you Jill education is is so critical and I think we talked about this the other day uh, mm -hmm. when we had a little catch up didn't we about um, mm -hmm. the home economics and I was saying in Germany that is still very much still part of the curriculum and it's it's helped me you know fix buttons on my, my shirt uh, I'm wearing many shirts at the moment but it's, it's this whole kind of right to repair. And, and Gavin, you, you're a big fan of repairing things as well. I think you're really into your cars, aren't you? Well, well most things we, we actually have, we're the, I think, and it's probably through about to my father, you know, we have a, the, if the kids ever broke anything when they were younger, it, it goes, it went on the end of the shelf in the kitchen until I got around to get the super glue out or the, and I, I, I still, you know, I, I'm still a kind of big fan of, you know, the repair and renew we, we we put a during um lockdown we, we extended our patio and of course that's you know sourcing stone and moving it around you know so i decided to kind of set a task of trying to create the uh most minimal impact and as luck would have it my neighbor from two doors down was lifting their patio and throwing it out so i said well i'll have it and, and it traveled 80 yards 
you know, which, you know, which, you know a couple of tons of stone. Um, the sand we did have to buy um, or we had to get it sourced. Um, so, yeah, I think it, it's, you know, and we went to the reclaim yard. I got an old whiskey barrel with a bit of slate on top of it. There's the new pizza stand, you know, and the bench is a couple of wire baskets full of reclaimed stones with a couple of old bits of oak on top of it, you know, which I do have to credit the design to, you know, my wife more than myself. But it does show, and actually Jill and I were having this debate earlier because we were talking about cars. Because mm. I, I have a slightly controversial view about, no, I wouldn't say controversial views. The, the British Design Council uh, defines an impact or an ecological impact is from dust to dust. So anything that you make, it's from where you dug out the raw materials to make said thing, how long a life said thing has, whether it has a positive, negative impact, and then at the end of the life, how easy is it to dispose it and put it back in the earth from whence it comes. That's actually the ecological input. So, you know, cheap pen, far more damaging than 25-year-old metal pen. Yeah, this mm -hmm. is probably already beating this, you know, by, I don't know, yeah, I wouldn't say 6,000% because that would be wrong. But the, the point that we were make, I was making with Jill about cars, we are having a chat. And, you know, for me, I, I like, I have an old car. My favorite old car is 49 years old. It's still younger than me, but it's, um, uh, you know, and, you know, Jill quite rightly said, well, you know, old cars, you know, not good miles per gallon. And I said, well, yeah, I, I agree with that. But how many Nissan Micras have been made for my 49-year-old car? That haven't been bought. You know, imagine if we, you know, if we very simply, because I have a very simple rule: when I buy a car, it must be for ten years. Mm. One of my cars is now twenty years, and you keep it well serviced. And you know, I, I don't have to drive, you know, a, a Citroen two CV with a, you know, a, a daisy painted on the door just because I want to save the planet. I'm allowed to actually mm. have air conditioning. Yeah, I'm allowed to actually have a nice car, but as long as I'm, you know, being sensible about it, because you know, I think. You know, a town cars, we see these little Toyota Yaris's, Corsas. Yeah, we say, oh, yeah, it's a 1.1 litre. It's the eco model. The energy to make one of those small cars is not wildly different from making a larger car. And it's going to mm -hmm. last town car six years, maybe 10 years if you're lucky. And that's it. It's probably, again, a lot of the small cars, you know, aren't actually marked up for being recycled. So they don't get dismantled. So, when you look at that, you know, somebody driving past in a you know, 30 year old Merc against somebody in their brand new registered little Citroen C1 cubed thing, whatever they're driving, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's the person in the Merc is probably going to leave less of a footprint. Or an interesting term that I've heard recently, which um, uh, I think I shared the blog with you, Alex, about. You did, yeah. Yeah. Our environmental shadow rather than our footprint, which I thought was a very interesting term because, you know, like you, you were saying, Jill, it's about the mm -hmm. supply chains. It, you know, you might be buying your favourite biscuits, but, you know, if they're not sourced ethically and made, you know, in a somebody that, you know, dumps stuff in a river or whatever, it doesn't mean, you know, you, you've got mm -hmm. you know, the whole chain, you know, of, you know. I do get what you're saying, definitely. And to be honest, it's like the reason why I've been quite sceptical of the whole electric car thing hmm. um, for, you know, since it's sort of first come out. I'm gradually coming around to the idea. But, I mean, fundamentally, it's these gigantic batteries. And has yes. anyone actually worked out how we're going to dispose of them in the end? And, you know, it's only you're removing the direct putting petrol in the car thing and the exhaust actually coming out the exhaust pipe. But it seemed to me that it was all kind of pointless if they were still eventually being fueled by, you know, um, yeah. fossil fuels. Yeah. Um, so, like, those factors really bothered me. And it seems that, well... I don't know. I mean, there is a volume. I mean, the other argument. thing that bothers me is how expensive they are and how it's such a premium thing. I was talking to my husband about it the other day and he was sort of saying this whole debate around, you know, the fact that they're tax-free at the moment. So that's why all the rich people are going across to them. Yeah. But, and I just sort of said, well, isn't this unfair, though, how basically the poorest people get screwed? 
again yeah. Yeah. Um, because it's just like well I'm not going to be able to afford one of these electric cars so god knows how long because like the cheapest ones you can get I mean, you can get ones for about like eight grand or something, but you kind which of have is, to rent the battery cheap. off of Renault and, and they're all terrible, you know, because they were the first generation. So mm. they're not they're not good technology. I splashed um, out, Jill. I splashed out. That's a great point. Let me just come in there for a second. Because I, mm. I splashed out. I was a big fan of um, electric cars and I completely mm. take the point about batteries. And it's good to see that. There's a lot of uh, battery recycling um, shops popping up to to do that, and a mm. lot or most of the energy that goes into the batteries is uh, is carbon neutral. However, absolutely the the whole tax thing and and the the cost of purchasing. When I bought a a Leaf, uh, which is a, yeah. essentially first generation mm. car with a fairly okay battery, it only had like eighty percent capacity in the end left. Um, and that meant it wasn't really capable of going that far. You know, going from Milton Keynes to London on one charge would be possible, but then you're running into charging problems. And this is the issue. I've been I've been encouraging people to consider switching to a, an electric car if they were looking to buy a new car. And I was making the same point Gavin made, I think, earlier uh, about driving the car that you have longer and looking after it mm -hmm. and making sure it's not burning oil and making sure it's got you know, a clean bill of health and is environmentally as friendly as you can make uh, an old engine. But having said that, you know, some engines that were in decent quality car, we were talking about Merckx, I think, earlier, they last for 300,000 miles if, if Top Gear and, and the Grand Tour is to be believed. But you need to look after these things, which is a lesson, in fact, that I'm coming full circle, I guess, where I'm teaching my kids about fixing stuff. And I'm saying your old laptop is still absolutely fine for what you're doing and maybe replace the hard drive with a faster one but don't you know buy the latest phone in fact i downgraded effectively to a used a two-year-old um pixel phone now from my iphone which was four years old because i was looking at the latest generation of phones and i was thinking do i really need the latest and greatest or do i just mm -hmm. want to take good videos and pictures of my children um and do I need something that is brand new? So it's really important to recycle, reuse, and fix the things we have. So I think going back to what you said, Jill, as well, it's about, you know, making do and mend and, and being more conscious about the decisions we make. Like what Gavin was saying, I love what Gavin was saying, and yourself as well just before, is that a lot of this stuff, I say it links in with holistic health, it links in with, like, being more natural and all that side of things. It also links in with traditions of being thrifty. Mm. Um, and and actually a lot of the stuff just makes good sense um, yeah. in terms of being thrifty. And if you talk to actually, you know, people of my grandparents' generation, then they would just be like, oh, well, this, this is just what you do. This is just how you live, you know. Yeah. So it, it's really interesting to me as well because I'm a virtual assistant. That's the other thing that I do. And um, and so even though my ideal place to get to is where all my clients are like eco and, and everything like that, like right now I have some clients who that isn't their agenda, but I actually find it interesting to point out to them the things which they are doing um which are actually eco by default i mean they give an example one of them's going through refurbishments on their site and they've decided to you know crush down the um, building material from the old building and make it into the car park you know use that as the material for the car park now that just makes good business sense but you know i've been trying to say to him this is actually eco as well you know but it's it's it, it's interesting because from my perspective, I'm all about celebrating those wins and stuff. But, you know, in that industry, and I don't obviously want to name names or anything like that, but um, there's definitely this sort of attitude towards, um, I guess, old school, what I would consider an old school attitude towards the green way. Yeah, it's a bit hippie, um, isn't it? In that yeah. it's probably quite feminine quite like short-sighted quite 
you know, tree huggy, quite against making money um, and all that. And they're getting a hard time from all these people kind of trying to push it on them, blah, blah, blah. And I just think, oh, goodness, what a shame. Because actually it's just because everyone, you know, it's this whole piece around the end users being blamed, being blamed, mm. being blamed. Um, and I'm not for that, you know, and I don't think that is the way forward. But, you know, we've actually got a lot of damage control to do mm. to get people back on board with it because they're, they've got 20 years of thinking green is like hippies yeah. blocking roads and stopping industry. Yeah. And it... it it's just not helpful. It's not helpful. It's not going to get anyone anywhere. Exactly. It it has this cultural um, thing, and I think it, you're right. It all comes down to culture: how we raise our children, what we learn in school, what the media are telling us. And I think, on one side, I have a lot of uh, people who say, "Well, I don't listen to the news, and I don't want to mm. talk about climate change." let alone being active, you know, it's too expensive, it's a fad, it's all fake, it's all it's all BS. And it, it's really, really sad because we were blamed by the people who caused this, by mm. the BPs and the shells. And these people, are, I just, uh, just saw a clip um, on, on Twitter from the Jeremy Carl show of all places, uh, who threw his hands up in the air and it's like, we are giving the British taxpayers giving um, BP or Shell, you know, a hundred million pound a year tax break, and they are making record profits. And then, you know, they have the audacity to blame the consumers and say, "Well, it's all your fault." You know, if you hadn't bought the cars, mm -hmm. if you hadn't bought the oil burning boilers, you know, we wouldn't be in this mess. It's like it's the rich people who get richer during crisis, and it's it's is the biggest most unbelievable crisis mankind has seen in its few thousand years of existence and and it is is it is dreadful to see that the rich people will probably be okay for their lifetime and their children's lifetime because they'll all you know go away and live on a space station somewhere with elon musk and and, and so forth but everybody else like the people like us are left behind on this planet to fend for themselves and we have to start teaching our kids to be responsible consumers and in fact i have this thing where I'm, I'm very much to the left of center i have to admit i grew up in a very you know uh middle class kind of household and i had all the the, the things you would imagine that come with it education and, and computers and holidays and whatnot but i still learned to be a conscientious and conscious mm -hmm. consumer and i wish that my children at the very least, I inspired. And in, in, judging by the chat, my daughter is uh, is going like, "What the hell are you doing, Daddy?" Uh, I hope that I'll break through that kind of consternation. Is that the word? You know, this this kind of uh, what's the use? You know, it's all messed up, and we're fighting big windmill yeah. win. You know, we. I think we can win. I think. People like you, people like Gavin, we can all do our bit. We can. It starts with being a conscious consumer and being able to to make an informed choice and saying, "No, I'm not going to buy the latest iPhone. I'm going to buy something I can fix and not where I'm locked in. Mm -hmm. If I need to buy something new, and I, I'm, I'm going to fix my shoes rather than and buying something cheap. It means you buy it twice, or as Tesco's and everybody else wants you to do. You know, the, the kids' shoes. Sorry, I'm going off on a tangent here, but Jill, back me up on this. Your mum. <laughs> I buy shoes for my kids to go to school. They have to be special kind of shoes. They have to be black. They have to be not fancy. Mm. The only place you can really buy them on the mainstream is in a high street, and they cost next to nothing. So they become a throwaway item. So my... um my son's shoes for the third time in the last six months are broken. Not because he does anything fancy with them. Mm. He just goes to school and walks and such. But, you know, you can't repair them. So the only other choice I have is to go to a really fancy shoe shop and buy mm. a pair of shoes he's going to grow out of in about six months. You know what irritates me, though, is that what happened to Grantano's? Because... Mm. 
Because Brantanos was a brilliant solution because they had all of Clark's second stock. Um, and fact of the matter, it doesn't matter if it's last year's stock or not, does it? Mm. And actually, I think there's a lot to be said for the likes of TK Maxx and, and um, Brantanos and these sort of places who are selling the seconds because it actually makes it affordable to the consumer. I'm yeah. lucky in that my mum very kindly treats the boys currently, <laughs> <not true. laughs> to Clark shoes um, since they started school. But I think, you know, it, there's an important thing here to be said about teaching your kids to be respectful of their belongings. Mm. Uh, I'm not by any means saying that your, <laughs> your son isn't. Um, no, you're right. They can do better. They can absolutely can but, do better. No, no, but just to clarify, I mean, for example, yeah. um, you know, my boys have finally got into using their little micro scooters, which I got secondhand on Facebook Marketplace, but like most of our stuff. But um, <laughs> but also, you know, they have a brake on the back of them, which you can press. But when I was out with them the other day, um, like one of them went to put their shoe down to scrape it along the pavement in order to stop it. And I lost my SH1T at them, you know, very quickly because I was just like, no, no, those are your expensive shoes. You need to look after those shoes. And, you know, I'm not, I mean, I know there's a whole piece around shame parenting and everything like this, but also it's being logical, being reasonable, you know, getting your kids yeah. to understand the value of things and, um, I think that's really important. You know, I'm also lucky that the boys' feet touch wood don't seem to grow that fast. <laughs> um, and, um, yeah, but uh, it's, it's really, really difficult because, like, when they were first toddling, yes, we use supermarket shoes, but as soon as they're running around and, you know, everything like that. But then equally so, it's it's a case of understanding that you don't have to have so many. <laughs> you know, I know yeah. kids who, um, you know, they have so many shoes. And I'm like, I just, I didn't grow up in that world where we had so many shoes. I'm like, I have one pair of shoes of each type. That's, that's how I operate. But each type of shoes you know then I have like a pair of Zimba shoes but I've probably owned them 10 years I have you know a pair of knee-high boots but again they've probably been around a good five years and I expect them to have a 10-year ratio you know I am not going with trends and stuff I, I think it's funny because it's something which again my mum sort of taught me from a very young age is I used to get like dress allowance in order to oh, wow. source my clothes I mean it was effectively that's what I, my pocket money was called you know I could use it for whatever but um it was I was to source like the cheap stuff like the tops and whatever but then she would treat me to a decent winter coat each year and a decent pair of shoes each year and they would be you know the kind of thing which could then be passed on and I was one of three girls so I'd, I'd quite often get my sister's ones from like the previous you know and everything like that um but I think I just had that mentality I still do now that when it comes to the certain things in your wardrobe which you can it's worth investing in because they're supposed to last. And I think shoes go in that category, winter coats go in that category, you know, coats in general go in that category. And I think, you know, it's it's also really promoting that, hey, you know, you've stopped growing now. <laughs> so, so, you know, it should last you a long time. <laughs> I wonder um, how people did this in the olden days because I, um, I grew up in a household where, you know, I still found my my dad dad's clothes in a wardrobe and i said why are you holding on to them mum and she said because they're still good and maybe you like to wear them when you grow into them i'm like i'm not going to wear my dad dad's clothes from the 70s yeah. i mean talk about star and being on trend um i mean I'm not, I'm not trying to be trendy but that that idea is a very different one i think in our culture gavin you're a slightly different generation if you don't mind me saying 
Um, what was your take on on this? Well, well, have you, I think, have you well, left anything to your children? Um, the we do. We do tend to try try and buy uh, once, but buy well. You know, I, mm. I you know, I, I I have some lovely you know Harris tweed jackets, but they just march on year after year. Um, mm. And, and but, but I think it's it's an interesting point that I would pick up on what Jill was saying because I agree that you know we have this problem. And I'm coming back to the shoes. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. We have this problem with the perception of you know oh it's all the sandal wearing lentil people that are trying to. And I think that's part of you know because you know acts very kindly calls me an environmental act activist. It's only because you use the tools that that are being used against us against. Not them, it makes mm. it sound like an us and them. Mm. But you know, the stuff that I'm doing with just carbon, which I will come back to and plug later, you know, that you know, that's about cleaning up the market and making it accessible. This is one of my and we were talking about um look background to shoes. Um uh, if I can find the chat box, I'm gonna drop a brand in here and I'll let Axe decide if he wants to share the link or not. Because mm. the, the, the problem is if people are going to buy so if we all say tomorrow, let's save the planet, stop killing the turtles, will people stop buying expensive handbags? No, mm. they won't. But what if expensive handbags were made by talented designers made out of old fire hoses, which are actually mm. a, an expensive thing to dump? What, what if they'd done a deal with Burberry and swept their floor and took all the bits of rubbish and leather off of it and then made great, beautiful art that people want to yeah. pay 1800 pounds a handbag? So I think it's how we frame. So, uh, yeah. so it's it's not making green cool. It's just being sensible about it. it there mm -hmm. are some I mean, I remember there actually being something on one of the Sex and the City movies of all of all the different things. For it was just interesting that her sort of personal assistant um, was using a rental company for like designer handbags mm. and it's stuff like that as well that you know i think there's so much that we could do i always say like if i was to have my time again i'd probably rent my wedding dress i mean this is a whole like other category of things but um i was absolutely determined that i was going to get a wedding dress which was made in europe because i knew it would be made not by children in a sweatshop yeah, and yeah. I was determined and I did manage to do that. And I invested in a dress which cost over a thousand pounds um, because it was made in Belgium um, on the premise that, oh, well, I'll sell this after the wedding and we get the bathroom done. That would be great, wouldn't it? Yeah, no one buys them. <laughs> 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 so, I mean, there's this whole thing. I mean, weddings, weddings and babies. <laughs> yeah. It's just all about this like, you must have new, you must have like the top end, you must have your child is special. If your child is special, you've got to buy them the top notch. But you know, if you earlier, want it to be the best day of your life, then you must have. To your point earlier, but the, the, the conditioned consumerism. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, uh, and what you were saying about keeping things useless. I'm full of useless facts. Axel can verify for this. Um, I also have a business where I advertise to uh, most pregnant ladies in the UK, but it's a long story about how I got there and why I'm involved with that. But the statistic that you were talking about the average parent, new parents, will spend between two and two and a half thousand pounds between the three month I'm pregnant to the birth. Mm. That will be mainly spent by lower income brackets because mm. higher income brackets have a loft, have a shed, have a, have mm. a country house to save the pram in. So this again, it get, kind of comes back to this horrible, you know, you must yeah. be because you've got to have the aluminium fandango click pram, you know, whereas, and, and, and I, I get really riled about this because they, they, they then kind of say, well, you can't sell a second-hand pram. It's not safe. Well, yeah, what, what, yeah. Well, the car seat thing drives me absolutely nutty. And um, because it's just like, well, you don't know it hasn't been in a car crash. Yeah. Now, what we've done with our car seats is we've bought them off friends yeah. because they're an extortion. And yeah. 
you trust friends. And um, I think my first set of car seats I actually bought from someone else in the twin community who hadn't managed to go out. Like literally she said she'd actually managed to leave the house in the first year like a couple of times because the whole experience was so overwhelming, which is actually a very common story you know and the same goes back to the whole shoe thing as well is that that can be the workaround is buying those you know (laughs) for want of a better way of saying it taking advantage of the people who have more money than sense and who are buying Mm. you know so many clock shoes (laughs) that they've pretty much been worn once uh you know why not buy off those people, buy something yeah. which is effectively new secondhand. Yeah. Um, and and I think there's certain categories, but going back to the car seat thing, you know, there's so much scaremongering around, you know, the safety piece. Yeah. Um, and I think this is, you know, it's horrendous propaganda really mm. um, because, you know, obviously it's the case that if it was in a car accident, then it wouldn't be safe. Yeah. But there is things which you can do. I remember when I went to the Open University talking to someone about this subject and she was a horse rider. And she said she bought um, she bought secondhand helmets right. um, for horse riding and they'd go through, there was somewhere you could go where you could get them x-rayed and you could see if they'd had an impact mm-hmm. and then you could then assess, you know, whether the damage was repairable or like, I'm not saying because obviously I don't, I'm not a scientist. I don't know, but surely something similar could be possible for car seats. Yeah. It's it's all, but again, it kind of comes back to a point of this, you know, kind of inbred, inbred, you know, driven consumerism, which is where Mm -hmm. I am going to come back to the blatant plug because just carbon.com is a business I'm working with now. And you know, the 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 challenges with all kind of um uh as we said to try and you know we're perceived as you know sandal wearing you know green tea drinking um even if green tea is quite nice you know uh, uh, people so the whole thing about just carbon is what what the world needs very simply you know in my view is love, of- sweet yeah. love <laughs> They also need people sequestering carbon. Yeah. People, and, and we need to, and people who are taking carbon out of the atmosphere need to be able to make a good living and yeah. taking carbon out of the atmosphere because we can't just hope some nice people will be. That's all right. It didn't hurt, it didn't hurt a bit. Um, there, we can't just rely that some nice people could do the right thing. So we're actually market making. So at the moment, if you are. You're, you have your mango plantation or your bamboo plantation. You your hemp farm? farm. Could could it be a hemp farm? Could it be a hemp farm as well? So you're growing your product, selling your product, but you also get carbon credits for it. It takes about six months to apply. You got to get so- soil samples, and then the proud day comes where you get sent your carbon credits. And the problem is, you, you don't know what to do with them. So a broker goes, "Have I got a deal for you?" And they buy them off you 30% below market value, double the mark, double the value, and sell them to out of a green consultancy. But what actually needs to happen is those carbon credits need to be swapped for cash. Mm-hmm. A fair agreed rate for a fair agreed quality, market making. And if we can get thousands of people to just log on, upload, you know, here's my new hundred credits. What we do is we tokenize. So, you know, in, in blockchain, we put a ton of carbon into a blockchain, uh, 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 like a token. So it says where it's come from for all time. It says where it's come from, where it's sequestered from, you know, Bob's banana plantation. These are the GPS coordinates. So completely transparent. And it also means that project developers all around the world can just upload their credits. Each credit, you know, sells on the, we sell on the open market for $25. So we actually just give them the token and they sell it on the open market. We don't actually make any money out of the project developer because that's not the idea of it. The idea of it is if we make a market where people don't have to deal with, you know, second market trading, environmental consultants. You know, there was a thing I saw the other week, you know, BP or somebody had you know, announced they delivered the first tanker of carbon offset oil. <laughs> What they bought enough credits oh. to offset the oil? It's like no, you know, no, 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 no. <clears throat> Greenwashing. 
The reason mm -hmm. the things that we need to do to save the planet is pay people to suck carbon out of the atmosphere in a tra transparent and accountable way so the the companies of this world, the Microsofts, the Samsungs, everybody else can buy the tokens, retire them, so they can't, so again, so they can't be on traded. And the only person that profits out of it is the project developers. So going back to the point of how do we actually do this, we do this by borrowing millions and starting markets like this. Because if you can start a market demand, you know, it's going to snowball. It, 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 it's like the fashion designers with the fire hoses. You know? Shouldn't we not all always all right up? Shouldn't we not also heavily tax people like Shell and BP and, and anybody who's putting the carbon out there? That, that's coming. Canada have done it. You know, America will do it within the next 12 months. Europe will do it. When Britain will get around to it, probably we, about we 2075. Won't. But, we won't know. do the UK probably because we are heavily subsidizing coal and oil industry. But again, it's forcing the market. What the Canadians have done is really smart. They, they, they're they forcing companies to buy, you know, carbon credits and they've got to buy tonnages and offset for the amount of emissions, etc. The bit of genius out of it is they put taxes up and then they give you a tax discount for buying your carbon credits. So the opposite of what the UK government is doing at the moment. Huh. So so in, in Canada, it will be law that part of your tax is paid in carbon credits. And and if you're an accountant, you're not just one to go to you know, plantatree.com, and I, I, I've just bought some trees. Where are they? Oh, they're in Brazil. The, the picture looks great. And I'm not decrying yeah, they're, trees. They're exactly two centimetres tall, about three months. I'm not decrying it, but, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio, who's our mm. world's first, you know, carbon-neutral citizen, you know, he really, really well-intentioned guy, proper, pro, a huge amount of respect for him. He, you know, he was one of the early ones who bought a forest. Mm. And he actually did one day, he said, take me to a forest. I want to go and see it and he went there and it was dead and it infuriated him so much he, he bought leonardo dicaprio bought a dead forest well no he bought a, a live forest but nobody looked after it and then he realized it's not just about planting trees so he thought it's i need to look after the forest yeah i mean forestry is a is a um catherine rose is a is a forestry teacher i've learned recently and and she's uh you know teaching people how to look after forests and and it's exciting because i mean i grew up half grew up in a city and half grew up on a farm so i'm a little bit familiar with forests but i have a lot of respect for people who do this full time because for you and i who walk through a forest with our kids uh, on a sunday afternoon is lovely but the amount of effort that goes into it in the in the forethought oh, to make sure that diseases don't fester and trees can actually grow and you know, it's it's crazy. I mean, one of the things I find very intriguing is everybody is looking at, you know, these credit cards and stuff that pops up on Instagram and Facebook. It's like, oh, get this credit card for the for the company or whatever, and we plant 10 trees. It's mm -hmm. great that we build uh, planting trees, but A, we need to cut down less trees. We need to have more sustainable forestry, and we yeah. need to make sure that, yeah. you know, we have – a reduction of CO2 that goes out. And one of the things I wanted to share with you as well was there's a graphic, oh, I'm going to put it out um, on, on Twitter again. It's It's been a steep increase in CO2 emissions over the last 20, yeah. 30 years. Yes. And they mapped, they had this lovely graph that showed the, the, the rise uh, in the increase in carbon emissions globally. Mm -hmm. And they mapped the, the Kyoto and the Paris and the COPs onto this so every yeah. time we have an agreement and say oh we're gonna yeah. maybe do something about the climate it's done absolutely bug all so i absolutely love what you're doing gavin yeah. with this with this marketplace i'm just wondering is there something more that our government should be doing and is there a role for local government where sometimes we have a little bit more um, yeah. power perhaps as local people I, th I think local government, you know, can have a far better, you know, impact. I mean, part of it, you know, is what Joe was saying about education. You know, it's about what we're dealing with at local level. You know, the the um, you know, if you allow people to come onto allotments and learn about allotments, they go, "Wow, I, that was actually quite easy. I'm going to grow something in my back garden." Yeah, there was, you know, the I, there was a thing where um, I can't remember the maybe one of your MK team remembers it, but. The York House, 
in the Stony Stratford, the big, yep. big back garden, the people in York House tended to be older or the users of York House. So they, they, they got a, a work experience, which was actually um, prisoners from uh, the local prison in MK who then came and helped with the garden. Anyway, a couple of those prisoners then, when they were released, you know, went into gardening work. You know, if, if you teach and you share and you pass on, and that's not yeah. anything about, you know, prisons being re rebuilt. It's just that sharing thing, you know, because if we are yeah. stuck, you know, in our, you know, Instagrammable best life, driving yeah. our white, you know, Mercedes, CD, X, I, whatever, you know, it, 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 it's, you know, it is, it's, you know, uh, uh, I guess, um, yeah, it, it's claustrophobic for for the average person, and I think because it's interesting because I'm lucky to work with some very nice people, very it's smart people, you know, in the the whole kind of green agenda, and you know, trying to get it's what Jill said earlier. It's, it's about getting that mind shift of where people, you know, look at the sea. I don't just look at the sea. They should look at the sea and go, "My God, it's full of microplastics." What the hell am I? Mm. Right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I need to learn about this. I, I'm eating them every day in my fish. I mean, I, yeah, I'm eating them, in, you know, they're in my makeup, et cetera, et cetera. You know, mm. the point, it's a really fine line because you can't just, as you were saying earlier, Jill, you can't tell everybody off for being bad. People will still want yeah. to buy cars. They'll want to buy nice handbags. They'll want to go on nice holidays. But we need to make sure that those nice cars, you know, it's a nice 1967 Bentley Mark T2 that they were going to recommission. Mm. Or, you know, they're buying a handbag made out of, you know, fire hoses. Or they're actually going to what was Marlon Brando's? Uh, he was the first guy to buy an island to create uh, uh, an eco uh, scientific study in the late sixties. Marlon and, Brando. Yeah, yeah. You look at you see it? on the cover of a magazine. Yeah, he 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 actually he was the first when he fell in love with an island that was oh god island of Doctor Moreau. It was a really yes, a really famous film. That Marlon Brando. Yeah, and he bought the island that he filmed on, and it was back in his heyday. And he put a scientific research station on it. And nowadays, it has a luck. It still has a scientific research station. It has a, a luxury eco holiday uh, uh, hotel. So you, ju you just completely ruined my view of Marlon Brando. Well, okay. Yeah, but, but, cool. I think, but but to the point. The point of the stories are there are new solutions for our new problems. We just have to be able to kind of embrace them a bit. People, you know, people can still earn a living out of being green. People can save money out of green. People become millionaires out of being green. You know, we just got to not to be scared to be green. And I think, to answer your question, can we do it at a local level? I think the local level, you know, is where if people have access to, uh, you know, um, seasonal grown fruit and veg, they'll, they'll eat seasonal grown fruit and veg, but how do you get access to it? Well, maybe the local council says, well, actually, how do we get a market for... All vegan markets in Bletchley. This is this is what we're doing in, in a hyper-local context. Sorry, Garen, i just got to put a shameless plug in there. We no, had a very right. successful first vegan market in Queensway in Bletchley, in Milton Keynes, and um, in the next council meeting, which is coming out very so shortly, um, I'm going to be pushing the idea of having it at least once a month because the people I spoke to, you're absolutely right. You put it there, people will come and buy it. And it wasn't yeah. just hippies. You know, in fact, there, there weren't any hippies that I saw. I mean, you, you are probably the only hippie I've, I've seen recently, Gavin, <laughs> and that's mainly because of your very traditional Scottish haircut. Or lack of Scottish haircut. Or lack of any haircut, for that matter, actually. Fair enough. In fact, you have not aged for the last 10 years, mate. With it being the inaugural live stream, there had to be technical issues. So thank you for your patience. Hope you still enjoyed it. And don't forget to tune in next Monday from 8 p.m. GMT. We'll be live on more social media networks. We'll be on Twitch, of course. We'll be on YouTube. We'll be on Facebook. And we'll be on Twitter, I think, or LinkedIn. Anyway, watch out on your favorite social media network. Thanks to Restream.io, we'll be uh, available on all of those platforms and I'm very much looking forward to receiving any kind of questions you have before, during and after each live stream. And if you know anybody interesting to perhaps come on and tell their story as a guest or co-host, please let me know as well. All of the links are in the description below and don't forget if you're on YouTube, give us a like and a subscribe. Uh, if you didn't like it, give us a dislike. Any engagement is good, right? Spread the word and thanks for tuning in.